given what you've said, what would all of this mean for American relations with, say, Taiwan, South Korea, or Japan? Well, in the most maximalist version of this stable balance of power, which is basically along the lines of what I just outlined, it would involve considerable change in both U.S. and Chinese and allied thinking and allied relationships uh, in the region. On the Korean Peninsula, I think the most stable long-term, and again, I emphasize this is about the long-term, the most stable long-term environment would be a unified Korea that is only loosely allied with the United States. That means it, you'd no longer have U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula. You'd no longer have a kind of tripwire presence there that would lead to immediate American military intervention. North Korea would no longer be there. It would no longer serve as the critical threat to the Korean state and the Korean people. And because of the removal of that threat, um, I don't see how you could justify the need for continued strong U.S. military presence on the Korean Peninsula. I think the Chinese would increasingly oppose it. I think they would regard it as unnecessarily provocative. And I'm not at all sure that the United States or Korea would need to have U.S. forces on the peninsula to ensure security in that part of the world. So that kind of a transition would be very difficult to undertake because obviously it assumes the North Korean regime no longer exists. So you'd have to think about modalities to moving towards that kind of an outcome. But in the meantime, the U.S. and China and South Korea and Japan would have to think more thoroughly about contingencies that could occur either through North Korea's provocation or through the collapse of the North Korean government or other reasons that would create a potential confrontation between the United States and China. The U.S. and China have not really talked about this probability or this possibility in the future, how to handle really destabilizing contingencies involving North Korea. At the very least, those kinds of understandings need to be attained between the U.S. and China in this kind of stable balance. Now, as you go down southwest from Korea, or to the east rather, you have Japan. While on the one hand I talk about a unified, largely unaligned Korean peninsula, at the same time I think a stable balance would require that the United States-Japan relationship remain strong. In fact, it would probably need to be strengthened to some degree, but within clear limits of the nature of Japanese operation beyond the defense of Japan's home islands. I think Japan does not need to operate uh, across the Western Pacific as a full-fledged normal military actor alongside the United States, for example, patrolling the South China Sea or in dealing with Taiwan as a combat entity. Um, it doesn't need to perform those functions. What it needs to do is to be sure that it can serve to defend the home islands and to do so as part of this mutual denial strategy that I'm talking about. It would be a critical player in that and it needs to be able to provide essential what's called rear area support for the United States further afield without a lot of bureaucratic and political obstacles that have existed in the past. Now this anticipates a improved U.S.-Japan relationship, yes, but one that is still significantly limited in how it operates beyond the Japanese home islands. Regarding Taiwan, I think that the United States and China, again, need to reach understandings that involve, in effect, the demilitarization of the Taiwan issue to the maximum extent possible. Now, how can you do this? Well, right now, the United States does not engage in any direct discussions with the Chinese in consultation with Taiwan over its military positions and policies towards Taiwan. It's restricted by something called the Six Assurances, which is not law. It's a statement of preference and policy. But it says that the United States will not discuss arms sales to Taiwan with the Chinese. Well, I think over the longer term, there needs to be a discussion and an understanding reached with the Chinese, again in consultation with Taiwan, about how to achieve mutual restraint 
in the sale of arms to Taiwan and in Chinese deployments vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I don't think this is an impossible objective, but I think something along those lines would be necessary to try to stabilize the potential for that issue to serve as a catalyst for miscalculation in an unstable future balance. It would be essential to have that understanding to stabilize it. Then regarding maritime territorial disputes, I think there also has to be some clear understandings between the United States and China regarding levels of support and militarization and activity in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. And those I've spelled out in, in a report that I'm going to be coming out with in, uh, in the fall. Some of your recent work has focused on differences between the United States and China in the area of global governance. Uh, what are some of the specifics in this domain that uh, stand between the two countries? Well, there are several issues um, that do stand between the two countries, but I should say, just to preface that, the United States and China have a lot of areas where they agree on what the global order should look like. Uh, it's a misnomer to assume that the Chinese are out to, for example, upset the global economic order. They're not. They recognize that their development in the future depends greatly on their ability to maintain and interact with a relatively free and open market-oriented trading and investment regime worldwide. And it's very unlikely that the Chinese are going to start adopting serious mercantilist, protectionist, or coercive means to try to achieve their economic ends. It's just not going to happen. The Chinese also, I think, are very committed to trying to limit weapons of mass destruction, deal with pandemics um, in, in various ways and other non-traditional security threats. Uh, so there's a lot of areas where they cooperate with the United States. The U.S. and China has over 50 different cooperative interactions and dialogues uh, with one another. So the basic foundation there is very strong. Now, in areas where they disagree, though, it is significant. The Chinese have a stronger or more restrained view, let's say, about the conditions under which other states or international bodies can intervene in the sovereign affairs of, of nations. Um, they're very sensitive to this notion that uh, the United States could, through a coalition of the willing, go in and invade a country without the imprimatur of the United Nations or the Security Council. Uh, they, they think it, it undermines the stability within the international order as a whole, and from their own self-interested point of view, uh, it poses a potential threat to their own position if states can, can do that sort of thing. Um, so there's a difference there. So the idea of responsibility to protect, which is supposed to establish, it's not yet a fully established norm in the international system, but it establishes a wide range of conditions under which the international system could intervene in the domestic affairs of a state in order to deal with genocide and that sort of thing. The Chinese are much less willing to support that kind of a principle. They, they think the threshold for doing that is much higher than it ordinarily might be from the viewpoint of many states in the West, including the United States. So it has that view. A second view it has, which is, is different, is it has a pretty significant difference with the United States and many Western case, uh, states over the operation of the Internet and cyber, the cyber realm, which is becoming an increasingly important economic and security um, device within the world, as we all know. The Chinese have a much more state-centered notion of, of what a cyber regime should look like that should operate worldwide. States should have a greater de degree of control over cyber networks that, uh, that, that touch on or operate within their, their territorial areas. They have a notion of cyber sovereignty. And they've put this forward in a proposal at the United Nations with the Russians and some others as a basis for a treaty. The United States and other Western states don't have such a state-centric notion of the cyber realm. They want it to remain open, relatively porous, uh, less centrally controlled by states, uh, and uh, more sort of bottom-up in its nature. That has a potential for real differences because it relates to questions of cyber security, relates to questions of cyber threats, 
of one sort or another that could become a source of real instability between the U.S. and China. So that's a, another big area where they have differences. And there are also some differences that they have over the representation of China and other developing states in international bodies, such as the World Bank, the IMF, and others. Uh, the Chinese think they deserve a greater voting share in these entities, which I think they do, and the West tends to be more restrictive of this. So there's a real difference in that regard as well. Do you see any opportunities for convergence between the United States and China in any of these issues? To, es to establish stability in this, I think the two sides have to establish a stable balance of power. In other words, they have to stabilize that balance of power that is in fact emerging in the region. And they can only do this by undertaking certain types of changes. The first change, beyond recognizing the situation, is I think they have to embark on a range of far more extensive confidence building measures and crisis management mechanisms that will allow the two sides to avoid misunderstanding and miscalculations in a variety of potentially dangerous situations running from the Korean Peninsula down through Taiwan and into the South China Sea and Southeast Asia and perhaps even beyond. So they need to do that. A second thing is I think they need to transition their force levels. They have to transition away from a more offensive oriented war winning strategy to a more defensive oriented denial type of force posture that is not as um, escalatory and does not rely so much on preemptive rapid action in a crisis. It's important for both sides to transition away to this mutual denial force posture. And then finally, I think it's important that the countries look seriously at those major sources of contention between them, as I mentioned a second ago, from Korea to Southeast Asia, and demilitarize and to the extent possible neutralize these issues as sources of future strategic rivalry. Where do you see the greatest opportunities for improving cooperation between the U.S. and China? Well, I think the greatest area for improving cooperation is probably, uh, in realistic terms, is probably in these areas of non-traditional security issues and the economic environment. Uh, the U.S. and China have recently shown much greater desire to cooperate on climate change. I think that process is likely to continue because it's being driven by some very strong domestic forces in both countries. Uh, so what we've seen recently in the agreements between the U.S. and China I think are likely to continue. I think the same is probably going to hold true in the economic realm. Although there are some very significant issues between the U.S. and China, in particular with regard to technology transfer and technology controls on foreign companies operating in China. I think over time, the two sides are going to have to, and they, I think they will, uh, there's room for them to clarify this issue in this area and to reach some kind of greater understanding that allows for companies to be more reassured that they can still continue to operate, protect their intellectual property and make money in China and for China to benefit as well. I think there's definitely room there. And then thirdly, I think there is room for greater cooperation in the Western Pacific on these areas relating to a stable balance that I think uh, need to be addressed over the medium to long term, if not in the short term. It doesn't necessarily mean establishing the maximalist kind of uh, features of a stable balance of power that I've been talking about, but the ability to create more effective confidence building measures crisis management mechanisms and understandings about some of the more volatile issues in the region, and the ability to move towards some aspects of this kind of denial force posture, more defensive oriented force posture. I think all of that is quite possible and doable uh, in the near to medium term, or at least the medium term. It would be essential to have that understanding to stabilize it. Then regarding maritime territorial disputes, I think there also has to be some clear understandings between the United States and China regarding levels of support and militarization and activity in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. And those I've spelled out in, in a report that I'm going to be coming out with in, uh, in the fall.